welcome to the ATAR Notes Bio 3-4 lecture for July. We're going to be talking about all things sort of related to Unit 4, particularly the first area of study, so a lot about immunity today. Um, my name's Loz, I'll be running through the lecture with you. Before we do get into it though, I would like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting from today. So the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So a few of you may be familiar with some of the lectures. You may have attended some earlier this week or, you know, in previous years or earlier this year as well. Um, essentially, ATAR Notes runs these lectures for, you know, VCE and a couple of other states and across Australia. Um, we do have a lot of other resources that essentially are made for high school students by past students. Um, so that includes the lectures. It includes a lot of other things as well. So some of the stuff you see here you may be pretty familiar with our study notes, also the discussion forums, um, you know, especially if you guys are in year 12, you may be using things like ATAR calculators, obviously a lot of, um, you know, revision stuff coming up into this next term. But yeah, if you do find yourself, you know, being interested, feel free to head to the ATAR notes website just to have a look at anything that might um, be useful to you. Bio is a really, really popular subject um, and a lot of people take it obviously. So there's a lot of resources available. There's a lot of input from past students and um, lots of resources kind of avail available, especially due to the new study design change. Um, you guys are the second cohort to use the study design. So I think there's a lot of useful information on there, maybe from past students who have done it last year as well. Um, if you do find yourself being more interested in some of our other resources, we do have a couple more. So TutSmart is the tutoring company run by ATAR Notes. So I tutor bio there, for example. Um, and there's a lot of other subjects available that you guys may be taking. Again, if you're in year 11 or year 12, I don't know, maybe year 10 even, um, there, you know, maybe something there available for you. Otherwise, if you are interested in the study guides that I was mentioning, um, you can get hard copies. You can also get copies of, you know, course notes, topic tests, some NEEP past exams as well, all available on Ed Unlimited. It's sort of like, um, like a little Netflix, but for our ATAR notes study resources. So you can access it on your laptop and your iPad, all that, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, you just have access to every ATAR notes publication. So if you do think that is something that might interest you, feel free to head to ATAR notes and you can register an account and have a look at all of these things, all of these things as well. Okay, so for our lecture today, we're essentially going through three major sort of blocks. Um, again, it's all to do with this first area of study of Unit 4. Um, it is quite a bulky area of study and, you know, some of your schools may have started with immunity already. Some of you may be going into it, you know, in this upcoming term. Um, it is a big area of study. There's a lot of stuff and it can get complex at times. I feel like sometimes it's regarded as, um, you know, the most tricky subject. Again, it depends on what people say, but I feel like sometimes it's a little bit notorious. Um, I don't think it needs to be. I think it is relatively complex, but once you break it down, it can be easier to understand. Um, I think for me, it was probably the area study that I enjoyed the most, I would say, maybe that or like area study one um, of unit three. But I, yeah, I really liked it. And I think it was definitely hard to understand, particularly the adaptive immunity stuff. But once you sort of break it down and hopefully once we explain some of the common pitfalls today and some of the, I guess, common misconceptions that students might have, um, hopefully it'll be a little bit easier to grasp. Already in these past six months, you would have probably picked up on some study strategies that help you for this area of study. I really highly suggest um, like a lot of videos or sort of visual stuff. Again, I know people have different learning types, but just because of the nature of immunity and the fact that it's on such a molecular level and there's lots of, um, you know, processes and sort of steps involved, um, sometimes watching a visual kind of explanation of that can be helpful. I know I found it really helpful. Um, so like a lot of videos, even drawing diagrams, you know, you can use others, but drawing your own diagrams can really help explain processes as well, going along with that lot of flow charts, that sort of thing. I feel like in bio in general, it's pretty helpful, but particularly for this area of study, or at least this first block in particular, kind of explaining your first, second, and third lines of defense, it can be really, really helpful. Um, in terms of the experimental design, 
again, schools may do experimental design in terms of your actual sack at different times. However, it's so, 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 so important to keep on revising this for your exam. Um, in saying that, while you're at this point of the year, you know, you've just finished unit three, it's quite important to be revising all of this information as you go into unit four, because the last thing you want is to sort of get to, you know, September, October, and you haven't looked at anything to do with transcription, translation, salary respiration in a couple of months, because um, then you're going to have to sort of waste time going back and almost like learning it again, when you could have been just revising it sort of infrequently throughout this term, um, just to sort of maintain that knowledge. I feel like it'll help you in the long run. Um, yeah, those are kind of the main things. We'll talk about some exam tips at the end. If you have any questions, please pop it in the live chat. I'll help you, you know, answer them and all that sort of stuff. Um, again, there is quite a bit of content, but I think we're going, we'll be able to go through it in hopefully a good amount of depth today. But if there's anything that you don't get, obviously feel free to ask a question. Um, but also these slides will be available to you and you can also email me as well. Um, it's just lordes at tutesmart.com is my email. So if after this, I'll remind you guys at the end, um, if there's anything that you feel like you missed or you'd rather email me about, uh, feel more than free to send me anything. But yeah, those are probably the main um, things, but we'll obviously explain more as we go through it. Okay, so the first part of the area of study is looking at um, kind of immunity as a whole. Um, so we have our little study design dot points that will appear in the corner. So just refer to them. As I mentioned this, the study design is really, really, really important. I've already discussed how you guys are ultimately the second cohort to use this new study design. Um, I guess it is, I mean, I feel like being at the end of study design is definitely a bit better than being at the start just because you've got past practice exams and things like that. Um, but there was, I would say, more stuff taken out of this study design than was put in. So I think that's a good thing that you guys can sort of work with and use to your advantage. Um, in terms of immunity, not a lot of stuff was changed. Um, I think most of the stuff that's in the study design at the moment was in the study design previously. But again, just some things have been cut out a little bit. Um, but yeah, use the study design to your advantage. I would try and not memorize it word for word, but definitely have an idea of all the dot points that are in each area of study, because this can be really helpful when you get to your short answer questions. Um, especially when you don't know what the question is sort of asking of you. Sometimes you just get to a question and you read it and you just, you just don't know, honestly. Um, and you don't know, you know, what it's trying to ask you. You don't know what it could be referring to. And at that point, um, speaking from kind of my experience, when I get to a question like that, I always just try to think, I almost like run through the study design in my head. And I think what dot point could this possibly be referring to? What dot point are these, you know, VCAR examiners, what are they trying to kind of nudge me towards, if that sort of makes sense. So I feel like having a good grasp of the study design can be really helpful for that, but I'll talk about that, I guess, a little bit later on. Um, okay, to start with our actual stuff, we're discussing pathogens. So it's important to understand the distinction between different types, um, you know, how antigens kind of appear on pathogens and that sort of thing. Um, definitions. So this is sort of the definition in terms of um, biological agents that can cause disease, basically. Um, so they impair the no normal functioning of the host organism. Obviously they replicate and that's how they can kind of spread their disease and how a disease progresses essentially. Um, and this idea of separating our pathogens between cellular and non-cellular, also very important because Vika will, you know, include questions about this. Um, in terms of definitions, sorry, I feel like I'm putting a lot of tips in before I'm getting to the actual content, but um, definitions are super important in bio. Um, more so than other subjects, I would say. I remember my teacher always going on about keeping a glossary. Um, and I think it is something that's really important because a lot of the questions in bio are definition based. So particularly, I mean, it can happen in multiple choice as well, um, but particularly a lot of short answer, they can use um, basically like a lot of marks are associated with using a definition um and i i feel like i didn't really like making a glossary particularly early on um so i used to kind of like ignore my teacher and be like oh whatever like a glossary like because i hadn't used a glossary in the past and i feel like i was very sort of stuck in my ways when i was um entering year 10. um i realized i didn't really say much about how 
I experienced bio, but um, I did bio when I was in year 12. So I did one and two in year 11. I did three, four in year 12. Um, I got a 45 in bio and I did enjoy it. I would say, I think I enjoyed three, four, I would say a lot more than one, two. Um, yeah. And I think I was able to do well in it because I sort of was able to figure out. And I think this is a really important point, um, how to answer bio questions. I always say to my bio students, um, it's a completely different thing, knowing the bio content and being able to score well, or not even score well, but being able to answer bio questions properly and getting the full mark for the question. Um, again, talking about how I was always stuck in my ways, I never really did, you know, practice questions and glossaries and that sort of thing. I was very much, um, uh, you know, do your chapter summaries and then, you know, write your notes and then you answer the question, you get it right. Um, but in bio, I found that that wasn't exactly true. Um, I would do my chapter summaries, but then, you know, cause I think I would get a pretty good grasp of the content, but then initially I basically wasn't answering the questions properly. I think bio is very specific in the way that examiners want you to answer questions in a particular way. And there's definitely a very particular marking scheme. Again, I would say more so I found it to be different to some of the other sciences where maybe that technique, my old technique that I used to use would work fine. But I think for that reason, you know, having a glossary, doing your practice questions, it's all really important because um, you can know the content like the back of your hand. But if you don't understand what the question is asking of you and you don't know how to phrase all the knowledge in your head properly, it's not going to work out and you're not going to get full marks. Um, so that is something really, really important to be aware of. Okay. I think I've got enough tips to share now. We'll talk about um, other things later. But in terms of the actual pathogens that you have to know, bacteria are a really important one. They're probably the most common one that pops up on your exams. Um, so unicellular prokaryotes. So they are cellular, um, but it's just one cell basically compared to your sort of eukaryotes and your more complex ones. Um, so prokaryotes, basically, they're just very, very simple organisms reproducing independently. So via binary fission, that is a big problem for them, I mean, I guess for us because of them, because of that idea that they can reproduce really, really quickly. Um, so obviously we think about pathogens and bacteria in this context of spreading disease, but bacteria are really helpful. We obviously, you know, we'll talk about our normal flora and stuff and how that can form a bit of a defense system. Um, but yeah, you've got bacteria all over you, your skin, your gut, everywhere, um, mostly everywhere, but, um, in that certain case, they're not pathogenic because they're not causing disease. In fact, they're doing the opposite. They're being helpful. Um, so when we talk about pathogens, it's in that context of causing disease. Sometimes you might call them opportunistic pathogens. So that's when bacteria that perhaps exist on your body that don't usually cause disease. Um, suddenly they get the opportunity to, and then they do so. Um, so that's just a bit of an example there. Um, in terms of the cell wall, this idea of peptidoglycan, it's not something vital to know, but it's um, something that is important for certain bacteria and it can be a good target for a lot of antibiotics. Um, and we classify them based on their shape. So you can see you've got cocci, you've got rods, spirochetes, all these different um, types. It's not vital for you to know, you know, what's what, and you don't need to know specific examples of bacteria, but just understand that they come in different shapes. Typically the ones used on a lot of beaker diagrams and stuff like that are your rods. Um, but yeah, there are different types. So just be aware of that. Be aware of some of the common um, sort of like characteristics. So you've got your, you can have like flagella. So, you know, this thing that almost like a little bit of a tail, you can have your pili, which sort of stick out. Um, again, you've got your cell wall, you've got a, like a capsule sometimes. And so all of these things can be sources of antigens. So we'll get into antigens in a second. Um, but basically just these things that can almost be like little tags on bacteria that our immune cells can recognize. So it's important to be able to recognize, you know, these things like flagella and pili. So you can see it on a diagram and know that you're looking at a bacterium, but also so that you understand that you know, the flagella may be part of an antigen that an antibody is specific for, for example. Um, but yeah, just get very comfortable with knowing key things about bacteria and knowing what they look like on a diagram as well. 
Um, okay, so ways that they sort of work, producing toxins, invading tissues, consuming nutrients. So, you know, you've got your exotoxins, your endotoxins. Um, not a vital distinction to be aware of, but just the idea of exotoxins being secreted while the bacteria are alive. And obviously the toxins can be harmful to our cells um, or, you know, the host organism cells. And then your endotoxins are basically when the bacteria bursts, when it dies, the toxins that are inside as an in endo, they leak out and then they can obviously cause a lot of damage as well. Um, so invading tissue. So we kind of think of bacteria as extracellular pathogens. So they exist sort of outside the cell and then they can come in and um, invade tissues. They can release these enzymes, release these other toxins that ultimately break down that tissue and break down the cells in that tissue. And that's obviously going to lead to, you know, consequences, symptoms, um, and ultimately sometimes death of those cells and those tissues. Consuming nutrients is a big thing because basically they just outcompete everything else. So you've got um, your bacteria and they're consuming nutrients that your cells need. Your cells are losing. They're going to die ultimately. Um, so that's often why in bacterial infections you can get um, changes in the level of glucose because of this idea that bacteria are consuming the resources that your cells need. Um, and that's kind of pretty general inhibiting normal cell functioning as well. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense. Viruses are your kind of second, like, main pathogen um, that VCAR often use. So definition here, obligate intracellular pathogens. So obligate um, is a way that they, because viruses are non-cellular, very important to understand that as well. Non-cellular, please remember that. Um, they can't reproduce by themselves, which is why they are an obligate intracellular pathogen. They rely on being inside a cell and having a host and having something that transcribes and translates in order to replicate. So that's why they're an obligate. They can't like sometimes invade a host cell and then sometimes they can just reproduce by themselves. They have to basically hijack um, the yeah, machinery or um, the replication system um, in order to replicate and then spread those virus particles to other cells. Um, Okay, so then as we've mentioned, yeah, so they will basically infect a cell, transcribe, translate the genetic information that sits inside of their little capsid, um, and then produce more virions or viral particles. Those will then leave the cell, infect another cell, and that's how the infection spreads. Um, and at the same time, they can go around killing those cells as well. So there are heaps of different viruses. Um, you can be based on their genetic information. So they may have DNA, they may have RNA. Bacteriophages are, they look like little spiders. Um, you've probably seen it when you looked at CRISPR, um, but they are very specific to bacteriums, um, bacteria, sorry. They aren't really, you know, they don't really infect human cells. So we don't see them as often in our examples or like in VCAR questions, um, but it might be good to recognize, especially in that context of CRISPR. Um, and yeah, there's other different types of viruses. Again, no virus that you need to know specifically. Some viruses will come up more than others. You know, you probably get a couple of questions on COVID, HIV, those sorts of things. But um, there will never be a really specific question about a certain virus that because it's not on study design. You know what I mean? Like you have to know viruses generally, but they'll never ask like, what is the exact specific mechanism of an RNA virus or HIV or, um, you know, describe all of the different antigens of COVID and stuff like that. Um, this is another common thing, a little tip with bio as well. You'll often see things that are unfamiliar. Don't let it psych you out. So you kind of get lost and think, oh my gosh, no, I haven't revised this. Like I didn't look at this specific example of HIV or I didn't look at this specific example of COVID. Um, because Vika often will try to distract you, especially in multiple choice questions. They'll give you this whole chunk of information. They'll talk, you know, all about COVID and this and that and blah, 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 all this random information. And you read it and you'll go, oh my gosh, no, like I haven't looked at this before. I've never heard of this before. I'm not going to be able to answer the question. Um, and then basically the question, the hidden question will be like, are viruses, you know, cellular or non-cellular, but they'll sort of hide it amongst all that information. So then students who aren't aware of what they need to know and what they don't need to know, might get frazzled. Um, so again, why the study of design is important because in questions like that, you don't need to worry and go, oh my gosh, I've missed something. Um, because you'll be able to read the question and understand that, oh, it's, they're just providing some extra context and almost trying to distract you a little bit. 
Um, okay, so prions are another type of pathogen that we can see down the bottom there. They are also non-cellular. They are ultimately misformed proteins. Um, so prions, basically, they're like, um, yeah, misformed proteins. You see them often. The disease may spread from animals. So if you have these really harmful misformed proteins, um, and let's say you get infected with one, so say you may eat meat, um, that's infected with a prion, right? So you'll eat this and you'll obviously eat the protein. And because it's a misformed protein, it will come into contact with the sort of normal version of the protein in your body. And then it will like convert it. It will change that normal protein to this misfolded protein. Um, and it's really harmful. It gives, it's, um, kind of affects the nervous system. So you get some of the neurological disorders. Um, so if you had like mad cow's disease and stuff like that, um, that's the kind of sort of things you're thinking about with, um, prions. So they are non-cellular. So important to remember that viruses are non-cellular and prions are non-cellular. Um, but your viruses are, you know, your little hijacking genetic information sort of thing. Um, and your prions are just misfolded proteins basically. And so prions are thinking more neurological disorders. Prions, I would say they honestly don't come up very often often um, in exams or as viruses, you'll be talking about them every second immunity question. Um, okay, so here's a nice diagram that sort of summarizes this. You don't need to know the cycle of a virus, but it just may help you visualize it. So you've got your virion, which is just a virus particle that enters the cell. You can see it's genetic information held sort of within that um, the center of that particle. And you can see it's like little proteins, it's spike proteins on the outside. This is a very typical diagram, like as in this of what um, a virus will look like. You can expect it to look like that in your VCAR exams. Um, but it basically, yeah, will insert its genetic information into the nucleus. We've got transcription going, and then we'll have translation going. Those proteins um, that that genetic information codes for, which is obviously just to create more virus particles. As you can see here, we've got our spike, pro oh my gosh, spike proteins and stuff like that. Um, those will be translated and then you get this new virus particle forming. It ultimately exits the cell and then this will go on and infect another cell. So that's the idea of how viruses work. Super important thing, just remember that it's non-cellular. Okay, so some of our eukaryotic pathogens. So these are cells that are a little bit more similar to our cells. Um, so a little bit more complex. So we've got our fungi. So they, um, you know, you think of like your fungal infections ultimately. So, you know, you like your tinea, your athlete's foot, that sort of thing. Um, their cell wall is made of chitin. So you can think again, just like peptidoglycan with your bacteria. Um, the chitin is sort of another target that you could use. Um, but yeah, those are your sort of fungal infections. And then your protozoa. So these are your eukaryotic pathogens, but they're single celled. So I feel like often we tend to think like eukary eukaryotes are multicellular and prokaryotes are single cellular. Remember that that's not always the case, such as these um, protozoa that are eukaryotes, but they're a little bit more simpler. They're so unicellular. Um, so these can sort of be quite parasitic. So like plasmodium um, is the cause of malaria. So often we think mosquitoes are the cause of malaria. They're the um, vector. So just like you know, in unit three, when you discuss plasmids and all that stuff and how your plasmid is the vector for sort of carrying your target gene into your bacterium. Um, your mosquito is basically the vector of carrying this protozoa, this plasmodium into the human, let's say. Um, so yeah, that's the pathogen we're thinking about. And then worms, so what we've got depicted here, um, you know, your tapeworms, your liver flukes, that's pretty self-explanatory in terms of what they are they just look like real worms as well um but they can be obviously a lot bigger and yet yeah, that sort of parasitic um nature and where they can just take up the nutrients and absorb all of that at the expense of the host okay so those are the pathogens you need to know really important again bacteria and viruses the main ones you sort of think of um okay so in terms of our actual sort of immunology stuff here so an antigen very important again different definition to know so it is a molecule that is capable of inducing an immune response so we've got our self and our non-self antigens so on our pathogens they will have their own little antigens you know if we're thinking of a bacteria um 
maybe just a little protein on the capsule or if we're thinking about the virus like spike protein that is the antigen it's just like a little i like to think of antigens as name tags it's just like a little name tag basically identifying um what that pathogen is and if you think of a self antigen so like your mhc markers um these are again little name tags that say hey like i belong to the body basically um so your mhc markers are your your mhc1 in particular are basically your self antigens um so they are found on all nucleated cells so be aware that they aren't on you know certain cells like um red blood cells and things like that but they have their own little like they've got their abo system so there's still ways of identifying cells there um but your mhc1 are essentially yeah your little name tags and the way that they work is and i think this is important to know i remember i didn't know this um this sort of second dot point here i didn't know it until we were kind of further into the area of study and I think to me, it helps everything click a little bit more, especially when you think about the difference between um, cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. Knowing what MHC1 actually does as opposed to just being a self antigen for me was really helpful. So just bear that in mind as we talk through them. Um, so with the MHC1, I like to think of MHC1 as basically little windows. I think I might elaborate on this when we get to natural killer cells and stuff like that, but they basically um, show immune cells. So I think of, I like to think of, um, yeah, so cells as houses, your MHC1 is windows and your immune cells as police. So your immune cells go around and they just basically double check everyone's antigens and make sure that there's no foreign antigens hanging around that they need to be a little bit wary of. So the way that they do that is through these MHC1 markers. So that's why I like to think of them as little windows because basically the police, so the immune cells, they run around and they look in everybody's windows. So they look at these MHC1 and MHC1 shows what proteins are being made in the cell. So they present peptides derived from cytosolic proteins. So your cytosol, proteins that are hanging around in your cytosol, they take like little bits of that and they put them on their MHC1 and then that shows the immune cells, this is what I'm up to inside of my cells. So that's why I think of them as a little window. Um, so then if something is going a bit dodgy in there, in your MHC1, then the police can realize and then they can sort it out. Um, yes, that's what I like to think of it as. So obviously if you're making the proteins that you're meant to be making, that's how MHC1 works is basically a self antigen, a self marker. It tells the immune cells, um, you know, I am a cell from this body. I'm meant to be here. I'm not doing anything wrong. Your class two are a little bit different. They are associated with antigen presenting cells. Um, so not every single cell has MHC2, only specific immune cells have it. Uh, and these will be used. Like I was going to say window again, but not really window. Um, these will be used basically just to show when you've got a foreign pathogen um, hanging around the body. Okay, so we'll show a little picture. So here is this idea of self antigens and non self antigens. Um, so your T cell, which we'll get into in a little second, is a really important immune cell. Um, so they go around and they, you know, can check what's going on. And it's this idea that you, um, they have different receptors. If there's a theme for immunity, it's receptors. This idea of things being complementary, um, you know, matching up, detection, all that sort of thing a very, very important sort of theme of immunity. Um, so your MHC1 markers, as I mentioned, are your self antigens. Um, and then your, you know, stuff that might be on a pathogen is your non self antigen. So T cells are able to basically detect what belongs in the body and what doesn't. Um, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so to get us sort of thinking, so when a virus attacks or infects a human cell, what occurs within the cell so again think about your um viral particles think about what our definition was so an obligate intracellular para obligate intracellular pathogen oh i was thinking parasite yeah obligate intracellular pathogen so we're going in a cell and we're basically hijacking that machinery um so we are undergoing transcription we're undergoing translation and that cells so our human cell will begin to become basically a virus making factory um 
So MHC1 mark is what they present on the outside of cells. So hopefully you guys are all thinking of the little analogy of a window. Okay, I don't know if it's helpful. It was helpful for me. If you think it's stupid, don't use it. Think of something else. But um, yeah, I just like to think of them as a little window. So they present your little proteins that your cell is making. Um, Again, just a way of showing the immune cells that you're sort of doing the right thing. If you think about it um, with a virus, if you're infected with a virus, um, what you would be making, if you're making viral proteins, um, you're going to be essentially displaying that on your MHC1. So that's this idea of how the immune system detects cells infected by viruses. Your MHC1, so your windows, they'll be displaying your viral particles. So you've got, um, I don't know, a home invasion, right? The virus is a home invader. I guess they come in, they start invading and your windows are still open and the police come around, your immune cells come around and they can see through the window that there is someone invading your home and then they sort it out from there. So that's the idea of how immune cells detect when cells are infected by viruses um, via their MHC1 markers. Okay, so looking at our first line of defense, um, so basically we, okay, first line of defense, I think it should be used kind of colloquially. Um, according to the study design, it's better to say, you know, your innate and your adaptive immune response as opposed to first, second, third. I think that's something my teacher used to tell me as well. Um, so just be aware of that. Sometimes it's easier to sort of comprehend your first, your second, and your third, but um technically like in when you're writing like I, in short answers I would never really write first second or third I'm sure uh, depends how lenient your examiner is and all that sort of stuff but it's always best to use terminology that's listed on the study design um okay so you've got your non-specific or your innate immunity and your adaptive or your specific immunity so your non-specific immunity and it's important to know differences between these um your non-specific immunity is basically your one size fits all works really quickly sort of like instant like putting a band-aid ultimately um so whatever the pathogen is if it's a virus if it's a bacteria if it's a prion if it's a whatever the innate immune system is going to act in the same way again one size fits all um there is no memory of prior pathogens so this idea of memory will make more sense when we talk about adaptive immunity but it's this idea that it's one size fits all and the cells that are involved with this um you could be infected with the same bacteria over and over again but they won't recognize it is the idea whereas in adaptive you do recognize it um and then the level of response being the same for each pathogen of the same organism again that idea if you're infected by the same bacteria over and over again um when innate immunity kicks in it'll just kick in it's one size fits all exactly the same copy and paste whereas with adaptive immunity because you have that memory of past infections if the same organism comes along that memory kicks in really well and you get a bigger response and then you get a bigger response and you get a bigger response every time something you know the same organism tries to infect ultimately um okay so in terms of the first line of defense so this is preventing pathogens from entering um the individual really a big one is intact skin you can see it's underlined intact if you just say skin you will not get the mark because the skin could be open the skin could be damaged um intact skin it has to be closed so that's obviously a pretty clear physical barrier um and that's why when it's open that you know skin is sort of useless if there's a big gaping hole in it because then the bacteria can just jump right in um, so mucus and your cilia in the airways. It's also important to know what is a sort of physical and what's a chemical, I believe. Um, but I think it's in the other dot point. But your, yeah, your physical, your chemical and your sort of microbiota, it's important distinctions to make. Um, so your intact skin would be more physical. Your mucus and your cilia can ultimately be both a little bit. Um, basically because the mucus, I prefer to think about it in a physical sort of sense, because I think it's easier to explain in a short answer. Um, your mucus can ultimately trap those pathogens and then the cilia just pushes it so it gets um, sort of chucked 
you know, back out or like swallowed and stuff like that. Um, but you, there are chemicals within the mucus as well that can help to sort of degrade that pathogen. So if you're going to describe it in, you know, a chemical aspect, just make sure that you're being specific and be mindful that Vika may ask you, you know, what are some examples of physical barriers? What are some examples of chemical barriers? And you need to know different ones. Um, so a low pH in the stomach. So this is chemical stomach acid is very acidic. Um, so it can kill certain pathogens, but of course there are some bacteria that hang around in the stomach as well. Um, so lysozyme, so these enzymes in your tears and in your saliva, they can help to degrade certain pathogens as well. Um, so your good bacteria, this should be referred to as your sort of your microbiome, your microbiota. So they're found um, in other places on your body. Um, it says a few exceptions, those are just sterile areas, but it's this idea that this microbiome helps because they compete with your bad bacteria. It's like a little bit of a good versus bad. Um, so when you, let's say you have a poor microbiome. So I was talking about opportunistic pathogens before. If you take um, an, if you take some antibiotics, let's say, um, they may be pretty general. And what they might do is they may end up killing um, some of the good flora, or like the good bacteria in your body. And what that means um, is there's sort of less competition. And so sometimes you can get other opportunistic infections. Often like um, thrush can be an, an example. So sometimes you have a um, fungus that sort of sits um, around your mouth, for example. And sometimes if you take antibiotics or even if you take um, like, uh, like Ventolin, like if you take steroids, um, then you basically, yeah, kill some of the bacteria around and then those pathogens that are left, they can become opportunistic and kind of grow. So that's why it's really important to keep a nice, um, balance of the bacteria in your microbiome, um, for that reason, because the competition is really helpful in making sure that they don't get too crazy, but then also that, you know, your actual foreign pathogens don't invade as well. Okay. So in terms of your second line, so let's think, you know, we've gotten something's gone wrong in our first line. Maybe we have a big cut. Now we've got pathogens that are entering um, our internal environment. So this is when the second line kicks in. This is your innate immunity. Um, so these are your sort of general leukocytes. Again, this is your sort of one size fits all. Um, so this is a nice little map of your leukocytes. The ones that are blocked out are part of the third line. So your adaptive immunity. So we'll look at those a little bit later. Um, but these are the really important cells for you to be aware of. Be aware, because I feel like sometimes I say it and it might not be captured as well. So this is a good diagram. But you'll often see this thing like a monocyte. Um, and they'll often link it to macrophages. So monocytes are just like an earlier version of macrophages. Um, I think it can be confusing. Sometimes students think it's two different things. But you've got your macrophage, which is a really big like main character in the innate immune system. Um, and then your monocyte is just like a, like the baby version of that, basically. Okay, so this is a really, really important table or just an important thing to be aware of. Um, flashcards can be good for this. Diagrams can be good for this. Whatever it is, just know the main features of these key innate immune cells. So your macrophages, um, basically we're thinking about them being really good at phagocytosis. We'll discuss phagocytosis in a second. Um, but it's basically just engulfing pathogens. Um, yeah, engulfing pathogens. Um, as in like phagocytosis, like, you know, like exocytosis and endocytosis. Phagocytosis, like they're just like eating the pathogen basically and they degrade it um, and chop it up. Your dendritic cells, or I should mention as well, they are an antigen presenting cell, so an APC. So that's why they've got MHC class two. Um, your dendritic cells are APCs as well, and they're like the best of the best. So your macrophages are very well known for phagocytosis. Your dendritic cells are very well known for antigen presenting. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Neutrophils, these are not antigen presenters, so they do not have MHC class two. They're the most common type of um, leukocyte that you see sort of in infections. Um, so there's really, really high numbers of neutrophils. Um, and then they, ultimately um, do this like little kamikaze thing. So they undergo apoptosis after phagocytosis. So with macrophages, when they phagocytose something, they eat it up, cool, they move to the next one, eat it up, move to the next one, eat it up, move to the next one. Neutrophils kind of like when a bee 
stings someone and then they die. That's sort of the idea with neutrophils. They will engulf a pathogen and the way they kill it is that they release all of these um, like really harmful enzymes and toxins or whatever. So it kills the pathogen, but it ends up killing them in the process. Um, so that's kind of a little characteristic about them. Mast cells really key, you always associate them with histamine um, and they're very involved in your sort of allergic and inflammatory responses. Um, something to be aware of is that they reside in the connective tissue. So they're not kind of floating throughout the bloodstream. They just sort of sit um, and release the histamine. Natural killer cells also quite important. Um, these work similarly, not the same, but similarly to cytotoxic T cells. So it's important not to get them confused. Um, and they release these two things. You have to know perforins and granzymes, which you can see here. And those basically induce death in um, certain cells. So they will detect changes in your MHC class one. So the way that they do this, remember that innate cells are a one size fits all. Um, so what certain uh, pathogens might do, so some viruses and especially some cancerous cells as well, they know that, you know, the police are coming around looking through windows. So what they do is they shut the window. So they, the MHC class one, they down regulate it. So they just don't have an MHC class one. Um, this is what the natural killer cell will pick up on. So the natural killer cell, again, one size fits all. It's not checking, you know, is this chicken pox? Is this COVID? Is this salmonella? It doesn't care what it is. It just goes around from house to house and anybody that has their window closed, as in any cell that doesn't have an MHC class one, they will release these perforins and granzymes and that will induce apoptosis, so cell death, and that will kill the cell ultimately. The cytotoxic T cell is a little bit different because it's part of the adaptive, so the specific immune system. So we'll talk about that when we get there. But just remember that natural killer cell, just like all of these cells, they don't care what they're killing. They just know that it's a pathogen, um, whereas the adaptive system is a little bit different and more specific. Okay, and then lastly, your eosinophils. These are kind of like the random, like, mm, like nobody really cares about it. But um important in your parasitic infections and they can undergo phagocytosis as well. Um, yes. Okay. So we have a lot of like little sidekicks that kind of support these immune cells. So your complement proteins, these are um, really important. So they basically just help these immune cells. So they can enhance phagocytosis. They can bring immune cells closer to the site of infection. Um, they can actually lyse some bacteria themselves. So they form this thing called a membrane attack complex and they just kind of like sit on the like plasma membrane or the membrane of the pathogen and they form a little hole and then it causes all of the contents to sort of leak out of the pathogen and then they burst and they die. Um, and then they can help sort of work with antibodies as well, which we'll discuss soon. So cytokines are also quite important. They're signaling molecules and they're basically just... Um, methods of communication. So if a cell wants to talk to another cell, they'll release these cytokines. So cytokines are cytokines, really important. Interferons are also very important. They're a sort of subset of these cytokines and they're released by cells that are infected with viruses. And what they do is they basically warn the other cells nearby and they tell them, um, I'm infected by a virus, watch out. Um, what they also do is they will release, if I'm a cell that's infected by a virus, I'll release this interferon and I'll send it to my friends, right? Telling them, be careful. But what I'll also do is I'll send it back to myself. So I'll release it and it'll bind to a receptor on my membrane and it'll tell me like, slow down with your protein synthesis. Like you're infected by a virus, um, relax a little bit. So that's um, why interferons are really quite impor important in viral um, infections. Okay, this is also extremely important, your inflammatory response. This ties in as well with allergies, which we'll get to. Um, so your inflammatory response is part of your innate immune system. So again, it's this sort of one size fits all idea. So we've got damage occurring to the site. So this is our intact skin. We've now got a hole that first line is breached. Um, so these damaged cells release chemical signals. So the damaged cells around here will detect that they've been...
you know, like the cells in the tissue here will detect that they've been damaged and that will sort of call your innate immune system into play. Remembering that your innate immune system is very quick. Um, so your macrophages are, you know, ready. They're going, okay, I'm coming to the site of infection, time to help out. Your mast cells, which are these ones here, remember that they sit in the tissue. Unlike these other cells, they're not running through the bloodstream. These ones don't move. They sit in the tissue um, and they'll, they'll kind of recognize like, oh, you know, something's going on here. And they will release these molecules here, the histamine. And the histamine really gets everything going in this inflammatory response. Um, so we have our main sort of symptoms. So redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. It's like a thing there, like your five like cornerstones, like major things of your inflammation. Um, and they all kind of come as a result of this sort of histamine and this idea of getting your immune cells into this location. Um, so the redness is because you dilate your blood vessels. So your blood vessels become leakier, they become more permeable, they become wider. So vasodilation, and that just increases the blood flow and allows more immune cells to get to the site quicker. The heat is because of that as well, because your blood is warm. Um, the swelling is because your blood vessels become, as I mentioned, like leakier and more permeable. And this allows immune cells to squeeze through the gaps a little bit more easily. Um, so that idea of them becoming more per permeable, sorry, means that your immune cells can come through. And so again, this causes a lot more cells in this area, a lot more liquid, you know, fluid in this area. And that's why you get this swelling. Um, pain you get just because of the damage to the area. And again, all of these cells in this one spot and loss of function is kind of similar to that as well in terms of all this activity going on here. Um, but yeah, that's what you've got. So your blood cells are leaky and more permeable. So all of these, you know, neutrophils, macrophages, your dendritic cells, they're all kind of coming in to help out. Um, and a lot of phagocytosis will go on. Um, and then basically they will, we'll talk about phagocytosis. They'll engulf these pathogens um, and then this will ultimately link us to the third line of defense, so adaptive immunity. But in general, that's what we want to think about. So we can see that the blood is leaking out here because of all our immune cells coming in. Um, so these are our phagocytes. So you can see here, it's just engulfing this little pathogen and it'll absorb it and just chop it up and kill it, basically. Um, okay, so we'll work through a little practice question. So which of the following matches a cell correctly with its role in an immune response? So um, basically working through a process of elimination here. So macrophage stimulates inflammation by secreting interferon. No, because cells that secrete interferon, it's your virally infected cells. Um, dendritic cell presents fragments of antigens to T helper cells. That sounds about right, because remember that dendritic cells are a really good... Um, APC, so an antigen presenting cell. Mast cell engulfs bacteria and debris. No, that would be more so a macrophage sort of thing. A mast cell, it's really key with releasing histamine. Remember that mast cells don't move, so they wouldn't make very good um, you know, things to engulf bacteria. And your neutrophil secretes antibodies. I know we haven't talked about antibodies, but they're associated with the adaptive immune system um, and your neutrophil is part of the innate. So that's why B is correct. Okay, so this process of phagocytosis can be seen in this diagram here. So you've got your bacteria, your pathogen, it comes in, it gets absorbed into this little vesicle called a phagosome. So your phagosome then fuses with this other vesicle called a lysosome. And in that lysosome, you've got all of these um, lysozymes, these enzymes that are involved with degrading things um, and yeah, chopping them up basically. So your phagosome, you've got your little vesicle with your pathogen. You've got your little vesicle with your degrading enzymes, um, or like digestive enzymes, kind of. And then you fuse them into one, which is your phagolysosome. And then the enzymes basically get to work. And you can see that they degrade this um, bacteria, this pathogen. And then this is kind of just expelled. So it's quite a neat process. Um, so this is what we can see here. Phagosome, your lysosome. Step four, you just combine them together. So that's the process of phagocytosis in general. Um, if you are an antigen presenting cell, what will happen is you're, um, you know, degrading, you're sort of like digesting this bacterium. You will get part of that. So it's antigens 
And what you will do is you will go and present it on your MHC2. So your MHC2 cells, just like your MHC1, will sit on the plasma membrane. So we'll take a little fragment of this, you know, showing your antigen, and we're going to put it on our MHC2 markers, which will just sit around here. We will then go and find our, you know, T cell or whatever, and we will show them this antigen, basically. Um, so that's the idea there. And then the adaptive immune system will kick in. So you can see that antigen presentation is the link between your innate immune system and your adaptive immune system. Um, perfect. Okay, so looking at our lymphatic system, so this is where we're getting into our sort of adaptive stuff here. Um, so the lymphatic system, basically it transports lymph around the body and lymph is sort of like a filter, filters your blood and all that sort of stuff um, and gets rid of like fluid and all that sort of thing there. Um, so it is like kind of closely linked with the circulatory system, but it's not blood. So it's not pumped by the heart. It just moves um, based on sort of like valves and your muscles moving and kind of shooting the liquid up. Um, so that's your lymphatic system in general. Your lymphatic organs are important because they're where our cells can sort of reside um, or grow. So lymphocytes will lymphocytes, sorry, will sit in your lymph node. So with this process here of your antigen presentation, when you present it to a lymphocyte, you're going to be moving to a lymph node. Um, so in terms of their names, T cells mature in the thymus. B cells mature in the bone marrow. So all of your lymphocytes start in the bone marrow. Your T cells will move to the thymus and that's where they'll mature. Your B cells will stay in the bone marrow. That's when they mature. Hence T cells for thymus, B cells for bone marrow. Um, and your spleen is kind of involved in this as well. Okay. So um, now we're getting into this real link here. So you've got your APC. Say you've got a dendritic cell. You know, we've had this inflammatory response. We've got an antigen, we're putting it on our MHC2, and we're now going to go all the way to a lymph node. So it might be in like your um, neck, maybe in your armpit, wherever. Um, but we go to a lymph node, and this is where we're going to interact with a lot of our lymphocytes. So our T cells, our B cells, all that stuff hanging around there. So once we've got our T cells, again, we're, get, we're getting higher up here in our hierarchy of immune cells, um, we need basically a more effective system to kick in. So what your adaptive T cells or sorry, your adaptive cells in general will do is they are very specific. So that's why we've got an antigen. Um, before we had, you know, our little one size fits all. We don't care if it's a bacteria, if it's a virus, if it's whatever. Now we've phagocytosed this um, pathogen and we are finding its specific antigen. Remember, an antigen is like a name tag. So now we're saying, okay, this is the salmonella um, bacteria. You know, this is E. coli. This is, you know, strep, whatever it is. And we're giving this name tag and we're showing this name tag to the T helper cell. And the, you know, macrophage or the dendritic cell is saying, you know, the innate cells, we've tried our best, but we need something more targeted here. That's the sort of idea that we're going with. Um... So you can see that here. You don't need to worry about the co-stimulatory ligand. This is what you're really thinking about. So we've phagocytosed to this. We've taken some of this antigen, put it on our MHC class two, and now we're presenting it to the T helper cell. And this T helper cell is specific to this antigen. So this is another thing as well. We're not presenting this to any random T helper cell that we bump into. We're presenting, let's say this is for like E. coli or something like that. We're presenting this to a T helper cell that is specific for E. coli. So this macrophage will be in a lymph node and it'll take it to a billion different T cells. It'll take it to the COVID T cell. It'll take it to the chickenpox T cell. It'll take it to the, I don't know, like tetanus T cell, like whatever. It'll take it to all these different T cells. But remember the whole theme of bio, complementary. We're thinking of receptors. So we're finding a T cell that has a receptor that is complementary to this specific antigen. That is a really, really important thing to understand. Okay, so these are all our main players in our adaptive immunity. So don't really worry about like naive and stuff like that, but um, you've got your B cell. So again, B cell will have sort of a similar receptor like this. It's to a specific antigen. If it's naive, it means like it hasn't come across it yet. So 
in our bodies, like in 2018, we had our little B cells, or oh, maybe B cells are bad one for COVID, but like let's let's just say, for example, right? It may not be accurate. Um, but we've got our little B cell that's hanging around that's specific to COVID or whatever other infection. Um, that would be naive because it hasn't come across its antigen yet. Then COVID came into our body and this B cell was saying, woohoo, I found my complementary sort of antigen. So that's the idea of when they become like a mature B cell or an activated B cell. Um, plasma cells and memory B cells fall under this division of B cells. Um, I think I'll probably explain it in a diagram, but this is a good table to refer to. Plasma cells associate with your antibodies. Memory B cell, you just associate it with being your memory. So they just kind of hang around and they're good for next infections. Um, helper T cell, like super important. Basically your coordinator of the whole adaptive immune response. They activate B cells, they activate other helper T cells and they activate your cytotoxic T cells. Your cytotoxic T cells, remember I said, were a little bit similar to your natural killer cells. They also use perforins and granzymes to induce apoptosis in infected cells. But instead of detecting when the windows are down, remember that this is part of the specific immune system. So they detect when the specific antigen is being presented on the MHC1. So they're looking in the window and they're not only looking in the window and saying, oh, there's an invader. They're looking in the window and saying, this is the invader's first name, their last name, their date of birth, all that stuff. They're being really specific. Um, okay, so this is a nice diagram that sort of encapsulates this. So this is our link from our innate immunity. So we've got our antigen presenting cell here. Um, we've got our antigen. B cells can also be antigen presenting cells. We just don't really like, like VK doesn't really use it in this context very much, but they can't be. Um, so whatever the case is, often it's an APC, they present our antigen. This T helper cell will now be activated. And what it'll do is it'll make more T helper cells. It'll, um, what we call clonal expansion is an important thing to understand for all of these. So remember that all of these have a really specific um, receptor, right? So there's not a lot of them. Like let's think about the COVID one, right? Before COVID came along, it's not really being used that much. Um, so it would be useless for you to have like a thousand of these cells, right? So you may have a couple, but once it's been activated, once this T helper cell specific to COVID, you know, in 2019 or 2020 came into contact with this virus, it obviously needs a bit more help, right? So it will go through this thing called clonal expansion. It will basically just replicate and replicate and replicate. So now we have a lot of T helper cells specific to this COVID antigen. That will then activate your cytotoxic T cells, which is what we've got here. This will also activate your B cells. Um, and the same thing will happen. Clonal expansion, you'll get heaps and heaps and heaps of these cells. So B cells will go into your plasma cells and your memory B cells. So the role of your plasma cells is just to make antibodies. And again, you've guessed it, your antibodies have those specific receptors to that specific antigen. Um, so these are really good for like bacteria and targeting sort of extracellular pathogens. Your cytotoxic T cells, you know, we've talked about like the windows, they're really good for um, intracellular pathogens and like your cancers and stuff like that. So that's the idea there. Um, okay, so summarizing this. So we've got a lymph node. Our T helper cell is activated. This is going to say, okay, let me find a B cell that has the exact same receptor. I found it. Now you're activated. Now this B cell, it's been switched on. It's going to divide and it's going to create so many more B cells and they're going to be both memory B cells and your plasma cells. So remember your plasma cells work to produce your antibodies and those will help kill your bacteria. Your memory B cells, they just their role is basically just to hang around. Um, and then once this infection is over, the next time that we get infected with COVID, let's say, we've got a lot of memory B cells hanging around. It's their job to divide into more B cells, basically. Um, okay, so yeah, plasma B cells, antibodies. That's the idea there. Um, so this is ultimately what we can see in terms of our sort of initial infection. And this is your um, your like antigen presenting cells. You've got your T cells and your B cells being activated. You've got your plasma cells and your B cells, and then your plasma cells producing your antibodies, which look like these little Ys. Okay, I am mindful of time, so I'll keep kind of going through it. Um, so T cell responses, um, are targeted towards our intracellular pathogens. So again, think of our 
viruses, our cancers, stuff like that. So you've got your, your outer lymph node, your APCs come along, T helper cells activated. That activates itself really and it divides and it creates your memory T cells and your T helper cells. Memory T cells, exactly the same. I will say VCA always talks about memory B cells. They never really talk about memory T cells, um, but it's just they have the same job. Um, and then your cytotoxic T cells will obviously proliferate as well. So here is how cytotoxic T cells work. Again, instead of um, your natural killer cells detecting when MHC1 is not there, what they do is cytotoxic T cells go and they zoom in on your MHC1 and they will see that if there are any basically non-self antigens being presented on the MHC1, and then they will release perforins and granzymes and kill it. So if you've got a virus, your window is open, you're showing your viral particles um, or peptides on your MHC1, your cytotoxic T cell is gonna come along. And remember, I can't emphasize it enough, it's all about being complementary, having the same receptor. So this cytotoxic T cell comes along and its receptor, whatever the shape is, fits really well over this um, viral antigen. So this is sitting in your MHC1. This is your cytotoxic T cells receptor. It's going to come along and go, ah, ha, ha. This is the COVID, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2, like whatever. This is the exact specific antigen that I'm looking for. I'm now going to release perforins and granzymes and I'm going to like destroy this house. Basically, I'm going to kill this cell and kill the virus in it. So that is the idea there. Um, okay, so allergens are similar to pathogens in an allergic response, but obviously it's this idea of people with allergies and our response to allergens, um, it's a hypersensitivity. So, you know, you've got things like pollen, dust, peanuts, compared to, you know, if you think about a virus or a bacteria, they can cause a lot of damage, they can kill you, right? So it's valid that the immune system wants to mount a response against them. With allergens, our immune system is basically very hyperactive and it sees these pollen, these dust, this peanut, which doesn't cause it isn't a source of a threat for us but for some reason it sees it as a threat and then it basically initiates an immune response so a lot of this stuff is quite similar but it's a thing that you have to realize with um the allergic response is that you have this sort of priming so what happens is if we've got someone that's allergic to pollen so the first time pollen is going to enter their body um, and we've got our immune system kicking in. So, you know, the same thing that happened with our clonal expansion, all that sort of stuff will be specific to pollen. And we're going to make antibodies to the pollen, right? Because we think it's dangerous. But something that we do is that with these antibodies, we don't really use it to like kill it, I suppose. Um, what we do is we take these antibodies. So there are specific form of antibodies, IgE and we sit them on mast cells. So that's obviously a bit different to what you do, like if it's a bacteria. Um, so you, again, this is your, so the first time your body has ever come into contact with pollen, we mount an immune response, specific antibodies are formed. These antibodies go and sit on our mast cells. And that's that. The person doesn't get sick, nothing happens. The second time pollen comes in, that's when we get this full blown response. So the second time your pollen comes in, and this is this idea of like sort of priming your IgE. So your antibodies are sitting on your mast cells and they're, they're just waiting. And so as that pollen comes in, what it does is it binds to that IgE and that causes a really huge response in your mast cells and histamine is released. And then you have this big inflammatory response. And that's why people with allergies, you know, have inflammation. They've got their, like they get red, um, you know, throat closes up, snotty, that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And that's kind of what I was talking about in terms of hypersensitivity. But yeah, the main thing to realize is that we've got our, our first exposure, like nothing happens to the outside. You don't have that allergic response, um, but your mast cells are just covered in this IgE. And then the second time it binds to the IgE and then it causes that response. Um, okay, I'm going to probably race through this question. Um, so cells of the immune system have different kinds of structures on the surfaces. So you've got self antigens, receptors for self antigens, and then receptors for foreign antigens. So hopefully that makes sense. So you've got a self antigen. So you can see that they've, they've all got three things. So you've got a self antigen, 
you've got a receptor for self-antigens and you've got a receptor for foreign antigens. So from the information, what are we able to conclude? Um, again, if you want, you can take like a screenshot of it and have time to think about it yourself and stuff like that, but I will move through it. If you want to go back to it on the slides, then I recommend that you do. Um, the way that you can look at this is if you realize that you've got a self-antigen, a receptor for the self-antigen, um, and for and a receptor for a foreign antigen, you can basically figure out which one is which on each of these because two of them will be complementary because you have a self-antigen and a receptor for a self-antigen. So they must be complementary, right? And then the third one should be a random receptor for foreign antigens. So what the question is asking you is what is a self-antigen for each of these cells? So if we go to cell P, this fits into that. So this must be the receptor and the self-antigen. So this will be the foreign one. So therefore A can't be right. B, so cell R. So this fits into this. So this must be your self-antigen and your receptor. This is your foreign one. Oh yeah, that's looking pretty right. Let's check the others. Uh, cell Q. So this fits into this. This must be your self-antigen. This must be your receptor. This is your foreign one. Um, which is not right here. And lastly, this fits into this. So this must be the receptor and the self-antigen. This must be the foreign one, which again is incorrect. So the only one that's right is B. I hope that made sense. Feel free to leave a comment in the chat if that didn't work. I know I went through that quite quickly. Um, but again, take time to go back to it using the slides if you want. Sorry, I just know we have a lot to get through. Um, Okay, so now looking at some disease challenges. So that is basically the simple, oh, it's not that simple, the process, the basic process um, of your first line, your second line, and your third line. So that's how immunity works in general. Now we look at, you know, what are the types of immunity, looking at vaccination, stuff when immunity might, you know, be going wrong, all that sort of thing. Um, okay, this is probably the easiest part of immunity, I would say, maybe. So you've got your natural and official immunity that you have to distinguish between and your active and your passive immunity immunity that you have to distinguish as well. Um, so your natural immunity, this is when you have um, ultimately antibodies that you've made yourself, basically. Um, so with your natural immunity, you have basically been infected by something and then you are expressing antibodies. Um, in your artificial immunity, this is when the antibodies are basically not your own, ultimately. Um, so with your active immunity, this is when your antibodies are produced due to the exposure of a pathogen. So again, this sort of, um, again, it might not be a natural process of infection, but this idea that your body is making its antibodies itself um, and then with your passive immunity, this is when you are not making your antibodies yourself. So it's all about antibodies. So natural immunity, the antibodies have occurred due to a natural process. Artificial immunity, the antibodies have occurred due to an artificial process. Active immunity, the antibodies have occurred due to your body sort of making them. Passive immunity, they've ultimately been made by something or someone else. So a really common example that they use is... Um, in terms of your natural immunity, you think about um, your natural active is like your typical thing that we looked at. So you're infected by a pathogen and you mount a response, you have antibodies as a result. That's your natural active immunity. Your natural passive immunity is when you um, basically are given antibodies through breastfeeding or through your mother that way. Um, because it's natural, because it happened without medical intervention, but it's passive because the antibodies have been made by your mother and not by yourself. In terms of artificial, so artificial active is your vaccination. So again, very similar to artificial, sorry, it's a natural active. The body's mounting its own immune response. You're making your own antibodies, but it's just the source. Natural is I bumped into someone on the street who had COVID. Artificial is I got the vaccine. Um, and then lastly, your artificial passive so you are getting someone else's or something else's antibodies via medical intervention. So if you are bitten by, um, yeah, a snake or something, then you will get this antivenom, which contains these sort of like pre-made antibodies. So that's why it's passive because you're not making the antibodies yourself. 
and it's artificial because they're being, you know, it's not coming naturally through your mum, it's coming from wherever else. Okay, hopefully that made sense. Um, so in terms of our vaccinate, oops, sorry, in terms of our vaccinations, um, so the process with this is kind of what I've just described in the previous slide. So we um work to kind of get immunity by injecting a little part of a pathogen into ourselves. So we saw this whole process of when, you know, you've got your APC and you get your clonal expansion, all of that. So we want the end results of antibodies, but we don't want the initial result of getting sick, right? So that's why we use an inactivated form of the virus or an attenuated or a weakened form. So, um, yeah, so basically like the pathogen is still alive, but it's just very weak or inactivated in terms of like, it just, it can't cause disease at all. Um, so that's why when you get a vaccine, you don't usually get super sick. Um, so that's why you yeah insert part of that pathogen. And the idea is that you have inserted the antigens basically. So on this inactivated or attenuated form of the virus, let's say you've got a um, pathogen, no, sorry, antigen. You've got an antigen from that pathogen and then your body's going to mount a response against that. So then again, the same thing's gonna happen. Your T cell is gonna be activated with that specific receptor, your B cells, plasma cells, so on and so forth. And so you get, the really important thing is you get those memory cells. The memory cells are really, really important because that means say like I've never gotten, um, I don't know, chicken pox or something like that. So I've never gotten chicken. Yeah, there's a chicken pox vaccine. So I say I've never gotten chicken pox. Um, so I get this chicken pox vaccine and now I've got this whole system going on and now I've got memory cells to chicken pox. Um, what happens is when I encounter chicken pox in my day to day life, instead of getting sick because my body, you know, hasn't seen chicken pox for the first time and it takes a long time because I've got these memory cells hanging around from my vaccination, my body will recognize that chicken pox antigen and it'll mount a really huge response. And it means that I won't get sick because it's going to work so fast. And that's kind of the basis of vaccinations. Um, so the really important aspect of that is having those memory cells. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. So this is a nice diagram to represent that. So, sorry. So this is your initial exposure. So I'm getting the vaccine for chicken pox. Um, so my antibodies, oops, my antibodies are being made, my memory cells are hanging around, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm getting this sort of primary immune response. So I've gotten a nice amount of antibodies. You can see that this takes a long time. So let's say that if I, I'm not, vac like it's not through vaccination, it's through actually being exposed to chicken pox. Um, this is a long time to be sick until your body actually gets to work. Anyway, so I've got my antibodies are hanging around. The numbers dwindle a little bit, right? Um, and then, you know, chickenpox is gone. The antibody number is pretty low, but I've got these memory cells still hanging around. Suddenly someone else is infected by chickenpox. I bump into them. Those memory cells are going to say, I remember you. I'm going to go through my little clonal expansion thing again, and I'm going to make all of these new plasma cells and all of this sort of stuff. And you can see that the amount of antibody skyrockets. Um, and that's because remember at your initial exposure, maybe you only had one or two cells that had this specific receptor to this chicken pox antigen. But now I've got a bunch of memory cells hanging around after this, you know, vaccination or after this exposure. So now I've got heaps of cells that are specific to this. So once this chicken box virus enters my body for the second time, the chance of it bumping into something that has a specific receptor is much higher, which is why I get this really quick response. And because there are so many other chicken pox, you know, memory cells hanging about, once I'm activated, I activate all of them and then you get heaps and heaps um, more cells. And that's why you get a much larger response the second time as opposed to the first time. And then it just goes on and goes on and goes on. And this is the process of well, when you get a booster. Um, so if you had your COVID vaccine, you get this initial response. And then if you get your second vaccine, you get a nice bigger response and then a booster and so on and so forth. Um, so you have a nice high level of immunity hanging around. With COVID, obviously it's a bit different because it is a virus that mutates pretty frequently. Um, if it is a bacterial infection or a viral infection that doesn't mutate that much, um, 
then again, it's like pretty fine. You can have one vaccine or two vaccines and a, or one vaccine and a booster. But that's why, you know, influenza, you have to get that every single year because it mutates. Um, and so the immunity that you've, you know, this is the immunity that I've got for the 2022 influenza. Um, but, and that's great. So like if that ha- comes through, you know, hopefully I won't get sick. Um, but the 2023 one is completely different. The antigen looks different. So then that's why you have to get another vaccine every year. Okay, please let me know if that didn't make sense. Just pop any questions into the chat. Um, the main principle with your vaccinations and for them to work is this idea of herd immunity. Um, so herd immunity is when you basically have enough protection from everyone being vaccinated that your vulnerable members of the community aren't going to get sick. Um, so the idea here is you generally need a pretty high number, so about like 95%. Um, and then that's when you've got this sort of scenario going on. So initially, nobody's immunized. Sorry, these people in red are sick. Everybody around them is susceptible. They get them all sick. Everyone gets sick. Um, so we've got a couple members of the population who are immunized. Again, these people are sick. Um, the people who are immunized they're not going to be sick, right? Because they're immune to the um, disease. But again, we've still got quite a lot of people getting sick just based on proximity and contact. If we've got most of the population immunized, we can see that this, you know, metaphorically, creates a nice barrier that prevents these people from not getting sick. And so these people may be people like the elderly or the immunosuppressed who perhaps can't get vaccines or who would, you know, be sick if they were to get a vaccine um and that's what this idea of herd immunity is it's very much in the name um it's the protection that the rest of the population gives to those who aren't able to be vaccinated due to the rest of the population being vaccinated so hopefully that um makes sense and it's obviously very helpful in containing um and almost like eradicating diseases as well Okay, so moving on to immunotherapy. Um, so this is when we basically influence the immune system or manipulate the immune system in order to cure certain diseases. Um, so monoclonal antibodies are a specific example you need to know. You need to know them in the context of cancer and autoimmune diseases. So with our monoclonal antibodies, we have, um, you know, just like any other antibodies and they are specific to for example let's say cancer um so what we do is we get basically a cancer cell and we figure out an antigen that a cancer cell may have and we put this into um like a mouse for example these are monoclonal antibodies that are made by mice so we put them into a mouse and then what we do is we um yeah, put them in a mouse. The mouse will mount an immune response against this specific antigen. So, you know, again, think about that little diagram with everything. And they'll all have this specific receptor to this antibody. So we're going to create plasma cells and they're going to create antibodies that have specific receptors and will target this cancerous antigen. Um, so the idea of epitopes here. So we have... um antibodies and then they're obviously specific to antigens antigens themselves have little parts of them so maybe i'll see if i can draw this out um okay so let's say that this is a bacteria and we'll say that this is an antigen um now there are specific parts of the antigen that antibodies will bind to so you might have this sort of thing on here obviously this is a very um you know their molecules and whatnot um okay i don't even know but yeah right so we've got three different things so these are what we would call epitopes so you can see that things can be specific for an antigen but then they can be even more specific to certain epitopes on that antigen um so that's why you can have for example here you can have three different antibodies for one antigen um so that's the idea there so some antibodies will be more effective for the epitopes than others and so when we figure out what antibody is the most effective that's the one that we'll harvest from that mouse and we'll clone it 
and then we'll use that in that individual because we know that that's a really good antibody. So that's why it's called like monoclonal because it's specific to one particular epitope. Um, so if that makes sense. So you just put it in the mouse. The mouse creates these plasma cells. You take the plasma cells. You make lots of them. Monoclonal antibodies. Um, okay. So this is a nice little diagram of that here. Um, so this idea of we pop it in a mouse, it does its thing, and we get these antibodies. So we fuse it with these tumor cells. Um, and that means that the plasma cell will just keep on going and going and going and going and going. Because they basically... Um, we choose these specific cells that don't have like an, an end date basically. And that means we can produce even more and more and more because the goal is just, we want to create as much, um, as many antibodies as we can. Um, so obviously this is quite useful. It is a developing area of research. You know, there's lots of other, um, diseases that it's being used for. Again, you have to know it in the context of autoimmune diseases. So, um, like rheumatoid arthritis, for example, there's, um, a uh, monoclonal antibody that's really popular it slips my mind now it's like rituximab or something like that i don't know you can have a look into it um but yeah that's being used you know in um the context of autoimmune diseases so you can use that if you've got an autoimmune disease so sometimes your you know your t cells they may be targeting your self cells um because there's something a bit dodgy with the t cells going on right so you can use these antibodies to actually target those t cells um as opposed to, you know, your cancerous antigens. So that's another way of using monoclonal antibodies. Um, but they're really helpful because they're very specific. As you guys know, I've been using the word specific about a billion times. Again, use it in all your short answers. Um, it comes up a lot in bio. But yeah, it's very specific. And compared to, you know, chemotherapy and radiation, which just target fast um, replicating cells in general, it can result in less severe side effects because they're more targeted to cancerous cells as opposed to, you know, like hair cells or skin cells or stomach cells, stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's basically the idea there. Okay, so in terms of pathogens, needing to understand, um, it's just kind of this context of COVID really, this idea of when known pathogens which you sort of eradicate can come back. Um, so it's just this idea of, especially it says there in the study design dot point in a globally connected world, you've got people moving about to different locations and we move very rapidly now um so it's very easy to be you know like in australia where we've got a lot of diseases that are eradicated and you may go to another area um and then you know pick up a disease that's endemic there and then bring it back and that idea of again coming into contact with other people who travel and that can spread and so that's this idea of re-emergence of pathogens that we know and are aware of but that we've kind of eliminated um so that idea of them kind of re-emerging. That's why sometimes you get like measles outbreaks um, or, you know, like tuberculosis outbreaks and all those sorts of things. Um, and yeah, it may be from areas where tuberculosis or malaria is more endemic and then that idea of kind of bringing them back. The other thing you need to be aware of is emergence of new pathogens. So this is obviously linking quite closely to COVID. Um, it's this idea that nobody has ever seen it before and it's this emergence of a new pathogen. Um, and it's this idea that these pathogens are more likely to cause pandemics. So things like, you know, malaria, tuberculosis, they're endemic in certain areas of the world, but they're probably less likely to cause pandemics because we are very aware of them. Whereas, as we've seen with COVID, if you've got something that's quite new and particularly something like COVID that's quite fastly mutating, um, it's very hard to get a grip on it early. Um, and then that idea of nobody having prior immunity, you know, nobody has your little memory cells hanging around. Um, so then that's when you get these kind of pandemics and um, new pathogens can do a lot more damage. Is the idea there. Um, okay, so thinking about the effects of European settlement in Australia and the effect on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. Um, the idea here is kind of what I was mentioning before in not having any immunity, not having any prior exposure. So it's this idea that in um, Britain, like before they came to Australia, we're bringing a lot of um, communicable diseases with us on the boat, right? Um, and it's things that are endemic to this area of Britain, for example, um, and that these people have been exposed to. So they're bringing that with them. 
And we're then bringing it into a community into a community that has not been exposed to these viruses before. So we can see, you know, smallpox, measles, influenza, this sort of thing that again would be um, prevalent in um, like the UK or in Britain. And then it's this idea of bringing it to an area where um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people hadn't been exposed to before. So they don't have any prior immunity um, and they're extremely susceptible to these diseases and it can wreak a lot of havoc. Um, and so that's what we saw with smallpox, this idea that there was an epidemic. There's lots of um, areas where you had really large outbreaks because ultimately nobody had immunity to it. Whereas, you know, some of the other people, um, like other people in Britain and obviously those that colonized Australia, they would have certain levels of immunity to it, having probably been exposed to it in childhood and things like that. Um, so that's just one of, you know, the many obviously negative effects um, and this idea of, you know, globally connected worlds and things like that and this spread of travel um, and how that can bring diseases. And we see that in lots of other examples of colonization as well and how that can really wipe out and ravage um, a lot of communities. So hopefully that makes sense. It's just this idea of being exposed to something that you haven't been exposed to before and being extremely vulnerable to it. Okay, so in terms of the transmission of infection, um, so we're looking at this idea of um, this chain of infection. So it's this idea that when you have a pathogen, it kind of follows all these little steps. So you've got um, an infectious pathogen, um, you have a susceptible host, really, and this pathogen obviously infects this host via this portal of entry. Um, in terms of these reservoirs, it's where the infectious pathogen basically kind of grows and just sits and it then exits that. It's then transmitted into um, somebody else. So the reservoir may be another person, really. So the reservoir may be, um, yeah, another person and then they're able to exit that individual and then it's transmitted into somebody else via that portal of entry. Hopefully that's making sense. And then you've got the host who's infected and now they're creating more pathogens. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. You guys should be really on top of this by now with COVID in terms of ways of controlling transmission, particularly of our communicable diseases. So hand washing, physical distancing, face masks, all the stuff that I'm sure you guys are really, really aware of. Um, so there's a lot of modes of transmission. So respiratory transmission, droplet transmission, um, respiratory transmission is basically via the respiratory system. So you kind of pack it out via your respiratory system and then it goes into somebody else's respiratory system. Um, droplet transmission is kind of similar but a little bit different in that the pathogen can basically travel in the air via droplet. So when you sneeze on something and you then like touch it and then touch your face or whatever, that idea of being transmitted via droplets. Um, contact transmission, so via direct contact. So for example, the fecal oral route. Um, so yeah, if you know, the pathogen is excreted in the feces and somehow that kind of gets, um, you may not wash your hands properly after, you know, um, going to the bathroom and then you may touch your mouth or, you know, you may eat something and then that gets in by the oral route. So that idea of fecal oral, um, vector transmission. So we talked about malaria at the start, this idea of, um, the pathogen often being like a little parasite in that vector. And that gets transmitted as well. So if you think about malaria, for example, that idea of avoiding the vector, preventing um, areas, you know, so like preventing being bitten by a mosquito, um, getting rid of like mosquito breeding grounds, that sort of thing. Um, and then sexual transmission, so kind of bodily fluids, that sort of thing, pathogens spreading by there, so like your STDs and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so here is a bit of a question. Um, we'll try and read it really fast. Um, so BSE is a prion disease of cattle. So again, how we were talking about how prions often commonly spread from animals to humans. Um, so it's sometimes called mad cow disease caused by feeding cattle food that contains prions from other infected animals. So you've got prions from other animals and then you feed that to cows and then basically like the humans eat the cows. Um, blah, 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 blah. The time between infection and symptoms appearing can be up to five years. So you can have a prion in you, you can eat infected meat, and then five years later you get the disease. Um, if you think about it, that's an extremely long incubation period. Um, and you can imagine the kind of 
trouble with that. There are concerns that um, BCJD in humans could be caused by eating infected cattle meat. So this is kind of a variant from that. So mad cow disease is in your cattle, like the disease is in the cow, hence mad cow. And then when this kind of spreads to humans, it's um, your Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. So yellow fever is a viral disease that affects humans. So here we're talking about something different. So this is a prion, this is a virus. Yellow fever is a viral disease that affects humans. The yellow fever virus can cause symptoms three to six days after infection. The virus is carried by a mosquito vector. Which combination of approaches would be most effective at controlling the risk of outbreaks of both BCJD and yellow fever? So you can see how they look so much information and obviously it's helpful for context. But if you break it down, again, you're not expected to know what BCJD is. You're not expected to know what yellow fever is. Whittle this question down. It's asking, how can we prevent the infection of this prion? How can we affect an infection um, of a viral disease via a vector? That's the idea. They could have swapped the word BCJD and yellow fever out for anything in the world. Um, again, you're just having to apply knowledge that you have already. So prevent all cattle that show symptoms of mad cow disease from reproducing. Remove breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Um, test all cattle for the presence of prions. Ensure that all healthcare professionals wear gloves when working with infected patients. Um, in terms of yellow fever, so it's a viral disease that affects humans. Virus is carried by a mosquito vector. So you're going to want to look for something that is particularly targeting mosquitoes. So removing breeding grounds for mosquitoes sounds pretty good. Ensure that all healthcare professionals wear gloves when working with infected patients. Probably not the best thing. Um, ensure that people take measures to reduce their chances of being bitten by mosquitoes. Yeah, that's pretty good. Instruct people who are infected with yellow fever to wear masks in public places. Not the best thing because this would be effective for maybe respiratory transmission or droplet transmission but not really for something that's caused by a mosquito. Um, so you're kind of down to um, A and C. So you've got prevent all cattle that show symptoms of mad cow disease from reproducing, destroy all cattle that have been fed infected food containing the prions. Um, so again, we're thinking of A and D. They, they could both be quite helpful. So again, what this comes down to is what is the best answer. Um, so if you read you know, A or C sort of by itself, you maybe choose, sorry, you may be inclined to choose them, which is important. Oh my gosh, which is why it's therefore important to read all of the answers so that you can get the best um, option. So prevent all cattle that show symptoms of mad cow disease from reproducing. So that same, that sounds, um, you know, relatively good, but think about the method of transmission. So prions from other infected animals. Um, so basically the cow's got the prion in it, right? And then it becomes VCJD because somebody eats that cow. So if you prevent all cattle that show symptoms of mad cow disease from reproducing, okay, that might be good, but does that stop that cow from having mad cow disease? No. Does that stop that cow from being, uh, like cut up and then given as food? No. So that's why C is the better option. Destroy all cattle that have been fed infected food containing the prions. Um, because of that idea that you're preventing at all costs um, that from becoming meat that someone will eat. Whereas A, prevent all cattle that show symptoms of mad cow disease from reproducing. That doesn't. That cow can still be become meat and someone can eat it and they can get BCJD. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, I know we kind of raced through that one, but hopefully that's all making sense. Um, so we'll finish off with, you know, experimental design and our exam study. Again, the study design is really helpful. Um, with this, you just kind of have to fish through it and see what's actually useful, what's not. Most of the important terms are in here. Um, when we get to it, I will talk about reproducibility and repeatability because that's something that's been introduced with this study design. Um, but super 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 important if you haven't done your area study of three area of study three sack yet um do all of this stuff as soon as you can because it's really important for that sack but also for your 
exam, there are always questions on it, um, particularly towards the end of the exam. I want to say towards the end of the exam is when your questions get longer. So that's when you start to get big paragraphs, when you start to get lots of multi-part questions. And it's sort of where they try, or not where they try, but where they do tend to bring in a lot of area study theory stuff. Um, I remember when I did bio, I hated it. I hated it with a passion. Um, yeah, that's basically it, but you just have to study it and eventually, you know, you might find a liking for it somewhere. I personally didn't really, but um, it's really important. And I think because I hated it, I never wanted to study it, but I had to, otherwise I would have lost a billion marks. Um, so just be mindful. And I think something as well, I used to tell myself like, oh, you know, I've done this for lots of years. Like I know it really well, it's fine, but you have to work like doing practice questions with it um, so that you have ideas in your head of how Vika will ask questions relating to photosynthesis, relating to cellular respiration, relating to transcription, translation, DNA manipulation, immunology, all that sort of stuff, um, and how they will apply it in that context. You can't just say like, oh, it's an application question, so I'm just going to apply it when I get there. It's an application question, so I need to practice applying it in as many different scenarios as I can, is what your thinking should sort of be. Um, okay, so knowing your variable, so your IV is the thing that you manipulate, your DV is the thing that is being um, measured. The whole point of your experiment is to figure out what the effect is of the IV on the DV. Um, your controlled variables are basically any variables that could affect the DV that you obviously don't want to. Um, they need to be kept controlled. If you do not control these, there is no way of saying the IV has caused this change in the DV because it could be this other variable that you haven't left controlled and then your experiment is useless, basically. Um, so your experimental group and your control group, very important to distinguish controlled variables from your control group. Controlled variables are the things that could be the IV, just the little variables. Control group is the whole like setting. Um, so your experimental group is what is exposed to the IV. So if you are observing light intensity and its effect on photosynthesis, your experimental groups will be, um, you know, I don't know, dim light, average light, bright light. Your control group will be something in the dark. Um, it's something that is not exposed to the independent variable and it acts as a baseline comparison. And it also makes sure that you don't have any confounding variables. So you are checking yeah, light intensity on photosynthesis. You've got your dim light, your mid light, and then your bright light. Um, and then, you know, your dim light doesn't grow that much. Mid light grows a little bit more. Your bright light grows amazingly. If your plant that is in the dark, if that grows amazingly, you're kind of thinking, mm, something's going wrong here right because we're not exposing this to the independent variable so it should serve as a baseline it should be like a zero really um or it should you know if it grows three centimeters then you'd expect everything else to grow above three centimeters um it's that idea of that baseline comparison so that is why the control group is really really important and whenever you write about um a an experimental design, you need to make sure you identify that you have a control group. Um, okay, so your validity and your reliability. Validity is basically, um, is this measuring what it's meant to measure? So you can think about that in terms of equipment or in terms of your experiment. It's, is this experiment, have I designed it in a way that it actually tests the IV and the DV? So I want to check the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis is my experiment actually set up in a valid way that I am able to like answer the question basically? Um, it's similar to accuracy, but accuracy is basically, um, is this correct? Like um, my plant has grown by three centimeters. Is this sort of like actually how much, you know, it's grown by, um, has it grown by 30 centimeters and I'm using the world's worst ruler, that sort of idea. Um, reliability is if I repeated the experiment, is the result going to be the same? Precision is, are all my results within a narrow range? Um, in terms of 
your repeatability and your reproducibility. Repeatability is same time, same place. Reproducibility is different time, different person, different place. So your repeatability, again, think of the name of it as well, repeat versus reproduce. If I'm thinking about repeatability, it's if I perform these measurements again in the exact same context, the same person, the same equipment, am I getting the right results? If it's reproducibility, is it if I'm a different person on a different day in a different environment using different equipment, am I getting similar results? So that's what you should think about as well. Um, so having a large sample size, repeating the experiment is really important for your reliability and getting rid of your, um, oh my gosh, your error, your, it'll come up. Yeah, your random errors. That's the way I was thinking. I was going to say standard errors. Your random errors. Um, having a large sample size and repeating is really important for that. So random errors are just that. Really random errors, um, you know, sort of like fluctuations in atmospheric pressure, temperature, that sort of thing. Um, it's completely random and it will affect like one random result. Whereas your systematic errors affect every single result consistently. So it's often to do with equipment. So if you've got a measuring thing, like I said, like the world's best ruler, if you've got a ruler and it measures, it's got your one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, but in actuality, each of those centimeters are 1.2 centimeters apart. It's going to create a systematic error because you're using it to measure everything and it's going to be out every single time. Whereas your random error um, would be, yeah, the temperature in the room changed. So, so then, I don't know, the plant wilted or something like that. Um, so that's what you're thinking of there. So, um, be really aware of errors and ways to improve errors and things like that. Um, very, very important. Qualitative and quantitative data. I'm sure you've been bored to death of this sort of thing. Qualitative, quality, descriptive words, subjective, quantitative, more objective, more numerical. Quantitative data is what you sort of aim for. Qualitative is still very helpful, but quantitative is just a little bit more robust. Um, okay, so yeah. um, in terms of answering an experimental design question, very different to answer an experimental design question in an exam versus as you would for your like area of study three SAC. Um, so there are a couple of things just to kind of note. Um, so it depends how many marks. Generally, there might be about four marks ish, maybe less. Um, so you just need to be really concise. You're not writing out when you're writing out a method as well. You're not writing out um, a method as you would in your area of study three SAC where it's like a billion steps long. You're just being really concise and giving a nice overview about your method. Um, so your treatment and your control groups, your, you know, your experiment or your control groups. Remember that control group. It's really, really important. Students always forget it. Remember to include a large sample size. Um, remember to be as specific as you can. Dependent and independent variables, your controlled variables. Again, listing about three. A sentence or two. A sentence or two. Nothing more, nothing less. Um about your method. But again, you don't have to go step by step by step by step. This is a four mark question, not a 40 mark question. So really be mindful of that. Um, but at the same time, don't be too brief. You need to give a proper explanation of what you're doing. And lastly, repeating the experiment. Um, talk about this idea of, you know, your reliability or your repeatability, the repeatability, that sort of thing. Um, and talk about how you're minimizing your random errors through that. Hopefully you all said that at the same time. Um, but yeah, random errors are what you're thinking about in terms of repeating that experiment. Because if you think about it, if you have um, like four measurements and one of them is affected by a random error, that can skew your results based on if you've got 40 measurements. Um, you know, one in four things being dodgy, that's going to create a bigger effect than one in 40 things. Um, so just be really mindful of that. Okay, we will go through this a little bit. Um, so two researchers have discovered that they did not properly label a bottle containing the enzyme amylase, which catalyzes the breakdown of starch. The amylase could either be amylase from a human or from Thermus aquaticus found in 80 degree hot springs. So devise a test they could conduct on the amylase to determine its source and include in your answer which characteristic of enzymes makes this possible. So we're thinking about um, the optimal conditions of enzymes here in terms of temperature. 
So optimal in a human would be about 37-ish degrees. Optimal in this Thermos Aquaticus is 80 degrees. So you're going to try and figure out um, what works in what environment. So you'll have about four groups here. You'll actually have two different control groups um, because you will have your control groups at different temperatures. So you're going to do one in your human sort of thing. So you'll have um, your amylase with your starch in your 37 degree um, temperature. And obviously if that works, you know, and you get glucose from that, um, that'll tell you that it's a human. You will also have your amylase by itself at 37 degrees. That acts as a control because you don't want any glucose to come from that. Your thermos aquaticus, the same thing. You'll have your starch and your amylase at your 80 degrees. Again, if that works, you get glucose from there. You're thinking of your thermos aquaticus being from there. Um, you're also going to have another control group. You're going to have your starch at your 80 degrees. So you can see what I mean by two control groups there. Um, so your independent variable is essentially the temperature. Your um, dependent variable will be the breakdown of starch. So that kind of indication of the level of glucose there. Um, your controlled variables. So you'd think about um, the amount of amylase that you're using, the amount of starch that you're using, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of controlled variables, in terms of your method, you just kind of talk about what we talked about in terms of that setup. So maybe you leave it for um, 10 minutes and you check the glucose reading every two minutes, perhaps. Um, and you would repeat the experiment. That's the sort of idea there. I don't know if I've missed anything, but you would just follow this little step. Um, okay. Maybe I'll leave you to have a go at this just based on the time, but, um, a molecular biologist suggests that the binding of a specific hormone to muscle cells causes them to produce a much greater amount of a specific protein design an experiment that the biologist could undertake to determine if his hypothesis is supported. So your independent variable here would be the presence of the hormone. So basically you'd have any specific hormone to muscle cells. So you'd have um, muscle cells and you would have some exposed to the hormone, some not, and you're measuring how much protein is produced. So dependent variable is the amount of protein X that's produced. Your independent variable is basically the presence of this endomon and your control group is the muscle cells without endomon. Um, you might use varying levels of endomon perhaps. Um, but yeah, your control group would be, I'm uh, sorry, your control variables would be, um, you know, maybe the amount of muscle cells that you've got, the, um, you know, presence of other hormones, you would want to minimize that. Um, perhaps, yeah, that's kind of what you're thinking of there. Um, in terms of your method, kind of what we've talked about in terms, again, of that setup, you would just leave it for a couple of minutes measure the protein level think about how you might pressure the mo measure the protein level um perhaps with a little protein x detector i guess that's the most um specific thing to be using um and yeah you would repeat the experiment as well okay but again feel free to write that out and elaborate a little bit more on that um okay so these are some of the ethical principles in this study design bioethics are um emphasized a lot more than they have been in previous years. Um, so integrity, basically just being honest, communicating all of the results, even if they're bad. Justice, ensuring that everyone is treated fairly, ensuring that, you know, whatever you're researching, like say it's a drug or something, um, it'll be accessible to like all people and you're not going to create this sort of unfair market really. Beneficence. So beneficence and non-maleficence are sometimes confused. Beneficence means doing the most good and non-maleficence means doing the least bad, basically. Um, so beneficence, you're always thinking about yeah, promoting benefits, always doing good. Um, and then non-maleficence, you're just wanting to avoid um, harm. You're wanting to not yeah, cause any um, negative consequences along the way, basically. And respect, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with respect. Um, okay, so approaches to certain bioethical issues. So they can be consequences-based, duty-based, or virtues-based. Um, so consequences-based basically means that the 
um, emphasis is placed on the outcome. So it doesn't matter what you did along the way, as long as the outcome is ethical, um, on, you know, matters what you did along the way, but as long as the outcome is ethical, that's where the most importance is placed. Um, Duty-based or rule-based is basically this idea that whatever the outcome is, you have to be moral along your journey or, you know, be ethical along your journey. So that's the kind of, they're almost a little bit opposite, duty-based and consequences-based. Um, and then virtues-based is this idea of if you acted sort of morally. Virtues-based is kind of a bit like, like a bit random. But um, yeah, consequences-based as long as your outcome is ethical, that's your main focus. Duty-based, as long as along the way everyone's being treated ethically, that's the most important. And virtues-based is as long as you acted really morally, that's where the most importance is. Again, this is very application-based. Um, you likely get like some sort of scenario and then Vika will say, um, if you were to act in a virtues-based, use a virtues-based approach, what would this involve in that specific you know, scenario or context. Um, okay, so a new drug to treat malaria is being trialed by scientists. To apply the concept of non-maleficence to their research, the scientists should ensure that what? So non-maleficence. Um, so any harm to the participant resulting from the trial is not disproportionate to the benefits obtained from using the new drug. Yep, that sounds pretty good. Data that shows the new drug is ineffective is not published. That would be um, to do with integrity and that would be breaching integrity consent is obtained from all of the participants in the trial that's just um i guess like respect informed consent really um the participants experience only the benefits of the trial more so sort of beneficence in that way um so precision medicine can be used to develop anti-cancer drugs that target and silence the gene or genes that cause a particular cancer the government does not provide funding for many of these drugs and patients may need to spend upwards of 100000 for one course when many courses of the treatment are likely to be needed to prolong life. This leads to unequal access to these life-saving drugs in society. Situation shows a lack of, hopefully you all said justice. Um, again, you had like seven sentences there or just less than. Um, you could literally just use the last sentence. This leads to unequal access to these life-saving drugs in society. You can answer the question just based off that. So again, be mindful of not getting too caught up um, in unnecessary or irrelevant information. Okay, um, so we'll finish off with just kind of going over some exam study tips. My biggest one, practice questions. I used to hate practice questions. My teacher told me to do a lot of them and I used to think it was silly until I like literally, as I mentioned, like didn't know how to answer or realized I didn't know how to answer by questions. Um, I would recommend practice questions for all of your subjects. For me, bio was the most important subject that I had to do practice questions for, just because they're so picky. Like you can think that you're getting all the points and like Loki, you are getting all the points, but if you don't write it in a specific way, they'll mark you down. Um, so use practice questions. Again, I know you guys are using a new study design. So some of the old exams may not be as helpful, but you can still go through them and you can still sort of recognize what is on your study design and what's not. Um, focusing on your weaknesses is a big thing. I, um, I, okay. I don't know what to lie. I didn't really do it for, um, my VCE subjects that much, but I did it for the UCAT when I was studying for that. And it was really, really helpful. Um, and I think I kind of take that with me in uni now, this idea of making a little log of everything that you get wrong and the types of questions that you typically get things wrong on you should do those over and over until you get them right really um so this idea you know i kind of mentioned like oh i would love to do questions or even subjects i'd like to do stuff that i knew i was good at um but then that doesn't help you in the long run because then i would stay bad at questions that i was terrible at basically um and then so the more you practice and do those questions and the better at them you'll get and then you'll want to do more of them um asking questions so obviously your teachers your friends um your tutors you know on the internet you can find resources for bio everywhere because like everybody studies bio um as in like you know it's done in uni it's done in like every school overseas that idea of bio being a very 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 popular subject um 
So there's no shortage of resources. So please use them to your advantage. Um, and also, as we get to this time of year, going into term three, again, a lot of you may be in year 11, a lot of you may be in year 12, um, particularly those for in year 12, but of course, if you're in year 11 as well, um, you can get really stressed at this time of year. So it's really important to kind of check in with yourself, make sure you're not burning yourself out, especially not now. Term three is often the one where you lose a lot of motivation. I know I did, and I think I got slightly burnt out. Um, burnt out, yeah, just like I, I got really demotivated by the middle of term three. Um, and so it's important, I think, not to go too hard too fast and always be checking in on yourself. And something I always do is I always gave myself breaks. Um, I knew that if I just pushed a little bit more, sure, like maybe I would have gotten an extra mark and a bit of a higher grade, but it would have come at the expense of my like mental health, really. Um, and I knew that it wouldn't have been productive for me anyway. Again, of course, everyone's got different learning styles, but I think it's really, really important not to ignore when your body and your mind just really need a bit of a break. Um, okay, so in terms of your exam, I know this is only coming up in a while. We're talking about exams at this time, but don't get too psyched out. You've got a lot of time. Um, and that's kind of what this point is relating to as well. Everything that's gone on in the past six months with your sacks and all that, you don't need to worry about them too much. Like, obviously your sacks are important, try your best, but your exam is where most of the money is. Um, and there's no reason why you can't improve on this semester's sacks and do well in your exam. And then that can take your grade up a lot as well. Um, my teacher used to always say that sacks are a draft. So they make up, you know, a smaller percentage um, of a bigger score. So it's important not to focus and dwell on sack scores too much, especially when you've still got a whole half of a year to focus on. Um, it's really important. And don't think and don't get into, yeah, the sort of headspace that, oh, you know, I've done badly in my sack, so I can't do well. Um, even if you do badly in all of your sacks, which I'm sure none of you will, um, but, you know, moving closer to the exam, still try in your exam. You can still do well. It's a lot more, um, a bigger proportion of your grade. So just always, you know, keep doing your best and don't ever think that um, a bad sack will mean a bad study score because that's not the case at all. I think in bio, I had a sack that was um, really quite low. Um, and I remember I thought the same thing, like, oh, okay, I've already flunked it. Um, but then I didn't. So the same could happen to you. Um, learn from your sacks. I know my teachers are a bit funny in like giving sacks out, but sometimes they'll let you like look at it, you know, in there, like they might not let you take it home, but hopefully they'll let you read over it. Um, and just learn. It's just the one thing, like learn from all of your mistakes. Like when you get into your practice exams as well, note your mistakes down, note, especially ones that keep on recurring and why you made the mistake. I always say marking your exam is almost more important than actually doing it because there's no point in doing an exam and not marking it because then you're going to make those same mistakes, you know, a billion times. Um, really, really, really try to learn from things that you get wrong and also things that you get right. Even when you get things right, think, did I get this right? Like particularly for multiple choice, did I get this right? Because I, you know, came to the right conclusion via the right pathway, or did I just kind of like guess a little bit, or did I think something completely wrong and I just happened to get this one right by chance? Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. Um, unit three, I feel like I mentioned this before, but keep on revising your stuff for unit three. Do not let it slip to the back of your head. Now is a really good time to think of all the stuff from area study one. I know most of you would have just finished like your, um, you know, if you haven't started immunity already before the term ended, um, but you might've finished, you know, your cellular respiration and your photosynthesis. Don't forget your transcription, translation stuff, your protein stuff. Super important. With antibodies and immunology, antibodies are an example of proteins. So all of the protein stuff from area study one, that's all relevant still in immunity. Anything that you talk about with proteins can still apply um, in terms of antibodies. So um, yeah, always continue to revise your unit three stuff. And it just saves you time because otherwise you're going to get to September, October. You're going to have to go back and relearn everything. And it's just going to be a lot harder than if you just did like a couple questions on the weekend um for the week or you know whenever you want but just like slowly revising stuff and keeping it in the back of your head rather than losing all of it um and then having to yeah catch up again a little bit later um okay practice exams 
Emphasis on maybe time. I personally started practice exams a little bit later, I would say, like um, maybe like six weeks out, I want to say. Take what I say with a grain of salt. It's been, it's been a long time, but um, yeah, I'll take like six weeks out. I know some, you know, the other tutors and some other students, some of my other friends even tend to start practice exams a lot earlier. It just depends on where your confidence levels are at. Just depends on how you feel you wish to prepare. For me, I didn't like the idea of doing practice exams before I was really confident with everything. Practice questions are different. Um, but practice exams, I, yeah, preferred to be a little bit more on top of the content. So I would actually be sort of like mimicking how I would feel, you know, on the day. Um, and I feel like if I did practice exams earlier, like, practice exams before I finished the content. A lot of my friends did that. A lot of my friends did that. I just never really liked that idea, but again, it's whatever works for you. Um, but yeah, with bio past exams, so many of them are accessible. Again, there's heaps of VCAR ones. Unfortunately for you, you're just going to have to like shift, um, sift through what is still relevant on this study design. Um, or, but yeah, a lot of schools do, those like exam booklets and so those are quite helpful as well and they tend to give them out pretty early um but yeah use your reading time think about how you're going to approach it are you going to do short answer first are you going to do um multiple choice first figure out that sort of stuff um and yeah try to build up your stamina as well so do it under timed conditions obviously doing it closed book um and mark your exams of course don't waste your practice exams it's kind of what I think, because otherwise you could just be doing practice questions. Um, we kind of talked about this in terms of keeping track of your mistakes, but yeah, it can be really helpful to observe them. Um, okay, I think this is the yeah the last slide. Um, so we've talked about complementary. This idea of being specific just comes up in bio all the time. Like I'm almost sick of saying it so much. Um, all the time. So. Just be aware of it and make sure you are explaining things, especially with immunity, like on an in enough depth, but also concise. I know that's so annoying to hear that. Like use a lot of words, but don't use any. Um, but being concise in bio is really important, especially because it's just so much stuff. Like I tend to be a waffler when I write. And I remember like this one, I was thinking about this one question in my exam that I did in 2020. Um, and I remember I like waffled on. And as I was writing it, I remember like I used extra line space and I was writing in the corners and I was like, oh, as I wrote it, I like knew like, yeah, okay. Like I've done what I'm always like thinking I shouldn't be doing. Um, so, you know, even if you have to plan questions, um, do that. But yeah, once you sort of get into that habit of waffling, it's hard to get out of. Um, and so just practice, practice, practice for those like practice questions really help because it's, it's technique. Um, as opposed to like knowing content. Um, I'm just trying to think about, yeah, the other stuff are just kind of general things. Um, I, I'm just thinking about if I have any other study tips that I haven't mentioned. Again, visual things always worked really well for me. Um, you know, hopefully I've answered most of your questions in the live chat, but, um, yeah, they always worked for me and I think that they helped consolidate information a lot. And sometimes I wouldn't understand things until I saw it visually. Again, you may be a different type of learner, but it might work for you. Um, yeah, flashcards, mind maps, all those sorts of things. Structure your notes around the study design. I don't know if I said that, um, but that's really, really important. Again, knowing the study design like the back of your hand, but structuring your notes around the study design can be really helpful because it can show you what is relevant and what's not. Um, creating mind maps linking the areas of study together as well, which kind of comes into that last dot point. Um, don't get too in the zone with one area of study. Like you don't be on immunity and think like, okay, I'm only talking about immunity. I'm only talking about immunity. And then Vico trying to weasel in this little question about proteins to do with antibodies, but you're like immunity, immunity, immunity. And you don't realize that you're having to bring stuff in from other areas of study. Um, I think I remember there was a question like that. I can't remember if it was on my exam, um, but it was about like photosynthesis and something to do with enzymes and then linking that to proteins. And I think Vika wrote like, you know, a lot of students weren't able to make that correlation. Um, 
so it's really important to not get too like to not like um almost like segregate the areas of study okay hopefully that all makes sense um again hopefully all your questions have been answered in the chat but otherwise do feel free to email me again lordes at tutesmart.com um, hopefully that has all helped. Again, immunity is a big topic, but once you break it down, once you get through the processes, um, and once you just revise them constantly and constantly and constantly, I know this will sound like it's a little, but it just clicks. Um, and I know it's easier, like said than done just to wait for something to click. But, um, if you keep on revisiting them, the process makes sense. And that's why I find like, if you, like, I read about it, I drew it, I watched videos, I tried to get as much information from it as possible. And, kind of absorb the information in different ways so that it painted a bit of a bigger picture in my head. I think with stuff like this where it's very processy, um, that can kind of help. And yes, don't let experimental design fall to the back of your mind. Always keep that up to date. Same with the rest of unit three. Okay, I will not keep you any longer. I hope that all makes sense. Thank you guys so much for tuning into the lecture. Hopefully it's been a bit helpful. And good luck with all of your exams. Good luck with bio three, four, um, any other three, fours that you're doing as well. I'm sure you do really great. Thanks guys. Bye.